Well, hello, and welcome to another episode of More Perfect Marketing. My name is David Baer, and on today's episode, we're going to talk a bit about the topic of content. So my, my my website, my original marketing business when I when I went on on my own is called Bear on Marketing, and it was the LLC that I incorporated, and uh, um, it was the the name of the agency that I first opened. But it actually started out as a blog. It was me writing articles. This is like you know back in the uh, the earlier days of uh, the internet, uh, in like the the early 2000s i think it was um and uh and i used to share my perspective my thoughts i however didn't really have any clarity around an audience who who i was telling all of this to i was just reading stuff consuming stuff i was a a big if you're a regular listener um you know i'm a big uh, direct response marketing fan and so i would go and i would read a book or i would watch a course or i would uh, attend a seminar and then i'd come back home and i'd write about it and i post well content can actually do a heck of a lot more than just be a, a place to share thoughts and ideas to a non-existent audience as, as i was doing back then and to help us explore all of the different opportunities that exist, well, it's not that long a show. It's not all of the opportunities, but some, is a content expert named Tyler Basu, who claims to be the only Tyler Basu he can find on the internet. And uh, while we're on this conversation, I'm going to spend some time Googling to see if I can find another one, but I probably won't succeed. Anyway... Joining me from just north of the border in the British Columbia region of Canada, Tyler, welcome. Thanks, David. I appreciate it. And uh, let me know if you find somebody. If you if you go down the rabbit hole of uh, trying to find another Tyler Basu, let me know if you land on somebody. I've been looking for years. I, I'm I'm looking for you know. I just found somebody on Walmart uh, with with your name, but uh, no, I I I will keep looking. I'll keep looking. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you know, I, I started off by talking about the content that I used to create, and obviously I, I was doing it more for me than for an audience, but uh, mm -hmm. I think times have changed quite a bit. Uh, this was a, a website that existed well before the, the social media uh, focus of the world, um, and to, to a certain extent, it was still a time, you know, 20-ish years ago, when consumers didn't really have the range of access and availability to information the way that we do these days. And so content plays a very different role in the in the buyer's journey. Um, right before we hit record, you you started to tell me a little bit about the role that you see content playing. And I wonder if you might guide uh, us all through, you know, the the different areas that content can play a role for a business. Yeah, for sure. And this is I think probably one of the biggest mistakes that any business owner or business owner that is hiring somebody to help them out with this uh, makes is they haven't clarified up front what it is they're hoping that the content they're about to create is going to do for them. And so there's this misalignment of expectations. You know, they think maybe that article on the blog was supposed to produce a book call, but it didn't. Why not? Or this YouTube video that they're doing. You know, why did it not generate leads? Well, maybe that that wasn't the actual objective of the YouTube video. So getting clear on like what the actual objective for your content is, is probably step number one. And then from there, you can start to um, choose, well, what what are, based on our skills and resources and budget, et cetera, what types of content are we going to use to accomplish those objectives? So the three main ones um, that I see businesses focusing on are they're either trying to get known so they're trying to create awareness um, among their target market uh, the second objective is they're trying to generate leads and you know build an email list uh, for example of people that are potential clients uh, for their offers and then objective number three is getting the clients you know mm -hmm. helping people else page but sometimes you're asking them to book a call and you're having a conversation just just depends on what you sell but those are the three main like priorities or objectives that I see businesses, business owners having for their content. And it takes all three. It takes all three to like 
be able to drive consistent growth for your business. If, if the only thing that you're publishing is stuff that says, hey, book a call with us to learn more, then you're kind of, you know, you've only got one piece of the puzzle in place. And uh, to accomplish the goals that come before somebody might book a call or, be, or, or buy from you, you need the content that would uh, first get them as a, as a lead and, you know, give them something useful that, that shows you that they're a potential client. And even before you can get the lead, you need to get their attention. And so that's where some of your content that it's, it's job is just to show that you're relevant to them. Um, that's where that, that content lives. So kind of a long winded answer to your question, but hopefully that helps sets up, you know, a bit of a, bit of a frame for, for this discussion. Yeah. I, I think as, as you sort of talk about those three areas, uh, it, it leads to kind of, there, there's a few different um, extensions to the question, which is, you know, obviously some of the content is more public than others because as, uh, as you're speaking to an individual out there, uh, and you are drawing them closer to your business, that content might not be always, you know, in a in a public setting like social media or your YouTube video form or or something. It might be behind, um, you know, an opt in form. I'm guessing is is am I understanding that correctly? Yeah. So any any content that you might be sharing with your leads, let's say, might not be as visible or even visible at all to the people that um, you're just trying to get their attention. And the the platforms that are generally great for driving attention are like the social media platforms, like you mentioned, even on your website, you you might have some blog posts or um, some pages that are, you know, maybe trying to rank for certain keywords that somebody is searching for. Um, there are these there there are certain platforms that are appropriate for becoming known by somebody for the first time and that's usually when they're in like information search mode you know they're trying to they've got a question or a problem they're trying to find the answer to and they might not know you by by brand name or by company yet um but they know that they've got a problem they're trying to solve they know they you know they know that there's something they're trying to accomplish and so you want those folks to find your content on those types of platforms, find you on social media or on YouTube or on your blog. But once somebody is like a lead because you've you've given them something downloadable or you know a resource of some kind or they've signed up to watch a free training from you, now you've now you've identified them as a potential client that isn't just willing to give you their attention, they're willing to give you their contact info so that you can you can follow up with them. Yeah. Those are the folks that you don't want to keep like hitting them with your content that was meant for you to become known because they already know who you are um, those are the folks where you want to use content to help reduce some of the friction in the in in their buying process or mm -hmm. prevent some of the objections that they might have that are stopping them from buying and so there's a slight shift in the kind of messaging that you're sharing with those uh, with those folks because they're already a lead and uh, those same messages might not be as appropriate to share with people who don't even know who you are yet. You, you know, as you as you're talking through this, I'm thinking about some some of the work that uh, you know, so a, a name that comes up on on our show quite a bit, just because <laughs> I'm such a fan, is um, a famous copywriter named Eugene Schwartz, oh, and yeah. and and he talked uh, and wrote a lot about. Um, understanding where the market is in general in a, in a couple of different uh, um, uh, ways. One is in terms of the sophistication they have uh, around the topic that that your business you know fills. Um, but but then also the awareness level they have of what it is that you're offering. And and I think it's that second piece that really um, we need to dig into a little bit more based on what you just said. Because it, it sounds like you're talking to and and a, uh, to an audience and about the topic that you're talking about with a very different tone and or familiarity, depending mm -hmm. on where they are in in these three buckets. Yeah, for sure. So when somebody uh, does not yet know who you are and you're just trying to become known, the way that you get their attention is is through relevance. You know, it, it could be, uh, you know, a podcast like this or a video or a blog post or a post on social media, but to, to actually make it through their filter of everybody's, you know, trying to filter through all the distractions and information that they're exposed to every day, 
you just have to show them that you're what you're saying you know has a payoff for them of some kind it's relevant to that problem that they're trying to solve so they're in that awareness stage that you mentioned that, that, that Eugene Schwartz described so well in, in his books. Um, once somebody is aware of the problem they're trying to solve, now they're they're out there and they're trying to figure out, well, who's got the, the product or the process or the mechanism or the service that can help me with this? And so those folks that are trying to understand, you know, who can who can help them or what must they do to solve that problem, um, those are the people where you want to be sharing content with them that gives them a taste of what it is that your process is or your product mm-hmm. is. Um, and then when it's, when, when they've, you know, gone down the rabbit hole a little bit and they've looked at a few options and they've kind of narrowed you down as one of the possible options. Now your job is to convert is to help them make the choice that you're the best option for them. And so there's some shifting of beliefs that happens there and also known as like chipping away at the objections that mm-hmm. they might still have. Um, and then once you've done that successfully, they, they make the choice that, Hey, you're the, you know, your, your business is the one they're they're going to buy from. So, uh, you know, you, you have um, been incredibly prolific online. You you've done a, a ton of creation of, of content that you've published. You've worked with a bunch of different clients. I wonder if you can, illustrate what you've been describing um whether it's you know giving giving us a, a full glimpse into you know a project that you worked uh, um on or if you want to sort of fabricate the <laughs> the 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 facts but gi- but guide us through this in a in a practical sense i'd love mm-hmm. to understand you know uh an example throughout the 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 buying journey or the or the funnel depending on which perspective you're looking at um yeah. of the content that fills each of these roles sure 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 yeah i'll give i'll give you an example um so for the past couple of years actually i've been uh helping my wife build her business she has an educator background and i've managed to turn her into an entrepreneur which is pretty cool um she sells professional development workshops to okay. uh, early childhood educators and so as we built out this brand for her, we had to pick like, what were we going to do to help her get known? What were we going to do to build her list and what we were going to do to convert her, her list into buyers. And so um, in the interest of focusing on like, you know, not spreading ourselves too thin, you know, she's working on this part-time, she's a busy mom of three. Like we had to like, really just pick one or two things for each of those objectives that we were going to rely on to move the needle. And so for awareness, we picked, uh, in her case, Facebook ads. And and that's where she generates the majority of the traffic to her website. And that's the one that like we, we pay the most attention to. Um, So we run basic Facebook ads that call out early childhood educators and say, Hey, you know, are you interested in professional development? Come check out some of our workshops, right? Um, to build her list, we cherry picked a couple of her popular workshop topics um, that were recorded as like one hour ish workshops. And we decided to give those ones away for free mm-hmm. so that people get a taste of what it's like to take a workshop from her. So we run ads to these uh, registration pages for these workshops. That's how we're turning a website visitor into a lead. Over the past year, we've built up this list of about six or 7,000 educators that have taken um a free workshop from her. And the moment they're on her list, there's some follow-up emails uh, that invite them to check out the paid stuff. Right. And there's like, there's a, there's a bunch of paid workshops that they can purchase that are self-paced, but whenever she's going to create a new one, she always does it live and Mm -hmm. promotes it to her list and people pay to attend live. And then she'll take the recording and add it to the collection of, of workshops afterwards. So we've been building out this library of both free workshops that are used to build her list and paid ones that are, um, that are, you know, the sources of, of revenue for her and, and the growth of her business hinges on just a very small, you know, a small amount of types of content. The main driver of awareness is ad campaigns that are run on Facebook. The main dr- uh, driver and builder of her email list are some of the free workshops that she chooses to give away. And then the main driver of her revenue are the paid workshops. And we connect the dots with, um, 
you know, some follow-up emails and some retargeting campaigns. And, and that's pretty much it. It's very simple. It takes her, you know, a few hours a week to run this business because this content that's in place is doing like most, it, it's driving most of the growth on auto, on autopilot. And she just has to, you know, a couple of times a month, create a new workshop or partner up with another educator and hire them to present a workshop and just keep like adding to the product library of workshops. Meanwhile, this engine of traffic growth and list growth is just kind of happening on autopilot. So, uh, you know, as you were starting to talk about this, I was thinking, oh, that's really interesting. There's one or two pieces at each stage. And so it's not like, uh, you know, our friends in the marketing world over at HubSpot who that's that they're a content generation factory with uh, or or uh, Neil Patel who is right, right. creating these giant massive blogs that can be you know um, found by any marketer or anybody searching for answers about marketing questions but then you then you went in a, in a direction i was not expecting which is ads to workshops and i'm thinking to myself are ads content are workshops yeah. content <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's a big myth that, and this is particularly relevant to um, people that are earlier in business or startups, and you know, if, if their marketing budget is tight, is you don't have to be everywhere all the time. Um, you can piece together your content strategy based on where your audience hangs out online, the one or two types of content that you've got the skills and resources to create, and just Focus on that and until it creates growth for you, and then you can reinvest out of the revenue that you collect from actually selling things to customers or clients into producing other types of content or tackling other platforms or advertising on more than one platform. You know, you can add those layers to your content strategy over time. But if you were to try to tackle, you know, too many platforms or too many types of content uh, too aggressively early on, because that's what you see others, you know, more established businesses doing, then you might be setting yourself up for overwhelm and spreading yourself too thin. I think in the beginning, like focus is really, really key. Well, I think, you know, even on top of that, that there's benefit to starting slowly seeing what's working and the the it's easier to track metrics around fewer things than throwing a lot of stuff out there that you're not tracking at all or not tracking effectively. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think there, there's, you know, there's a few reasons for that. And then you made, you made a really good point at the end of, of your comment there about a, a new or younger company, or even, you know, a company that's trying something in a new direction, mm -hmm. looking at what somebody who is uh, more established as a business is doing and trying to emulate that. And, and I think that's a, a universal mistake that we see with lots of businesses. Yeah. I, I imagine you see that in, in the content world all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, especially in this world of online marketing, like there's, you know, we, if we're trying to learn marketing, we're, we're generally seeking out courses and training and content from, from other marketers that are doing marketing. And marketers can be very good at convincing you to do, you know, to adopt the strategy or the tactic that they're using because they're good at convincing people, um, you know, just check out their stuff because they've got this marketing background. And um, so I would just, you know, caution business owners to always like keep at the top of your mind uh, clarity on who it is that you're trying to attract as your ideal client or as your ideal customer and then ask yourself of all these different marketing strategies i'm hearing about or tactics i'm hearing about or types of content i'm hearing about um it, put yourself in your buyer's shoes and ask yourself like would they actually like would they want to buy that way like you know in some markets people hate watching webinars and in some markets they do in some markets people love you know, signing up for free challenges and in some markets they don't. And in some markets, people are active on Instagram and in some markets they hate Instagram. So like you can't, before you just blindly follow anybody's advice on, yeah, you got to do this. Just, um, you know, ask yourself, would, would that be congruent 
with how my target audience wants to be marketed to and how they can consume content and where they consume content and how they make buying decisions. And just make sure you don't step out of the realm of doing things that wouldn't actually be congruent for who you're trying to attract. It, it, it sounds like you're a, you're a fly on the wall in pretty much every meeting I have because that's uh, that's a lecture I would give. So uh, thank you. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to I want to step back a, a little bit because I mentioned a few minutes ago that, that you've been incredibly prolific online. Um, uh, you've you've written over a thousand um, pieces of content uh, and. Uh, I imagine that there was something of all of the many things that you could have been doing in it, at your young age. Uh, you said you said you're you you have three kids at home, but uh, I'm I'm, I'm yeah. assuming that they're pretty young. Yeah, um, yeah. one's what, a baby. <laughs> <laughs> what what brought you to this world in the first place? How did you how did you uh, wander into the the world of marketing? Well, I actually come from a sales background. Um, I started off in door-to-door -door sales when I was like 19, 20 years old. And uh, then I did, uh, then I was selling real estate for a couple of years um, for developers. So I would work out of like a presentation center. And that was my first, you know, job or career after leaving the door-to-door -door sales world. And so in door-to-door -door sales, you know, you're knocking on a hundred doors a day. You're getting rejected all day long. You're trying to find, you're pitching anybody that's willing to talk to you. Right. And you're, it's a numbers game. You're filtering through a lot of people to figure out who's who's actually qualified and interested to buy um, what I was selling. And then in real estate, I would sit in a presentation center, and there was and the company that I worked for had a marketing department that you know ran ads on the radio and sent out marketing materials. And like people would walk through the front door of this presentation center, and my job was just to talk to them and figure out if we had a home that would work for them. And so that's when I like started to appreciate marketing because it it did the heavy lifting of bringing interested prospects to me so that I didn't have to go door knocking in the real world or online to try to find them. And it was while I was working as a realtor that I started creating content um, in my spare time, just kind of as a hobby at first. Started my first blog. This was back in like 2012 or uh, 13. Um, and then... Then a, then a podcast, and then I interviewed a bunch of entrepreneurs and learned about online business and content marketing for businesses. And finally, in 2015, I said, you know what? I like this content stuff better than I like doing open houses and showing people floor plans. Um, and so I made the jump into the world of content creation for other companies in 2015. Uh, that led to getting hired as a, at, a, at a software startup called Thinkific. That was 2016. And I was their content manager for a few years. And that's where I really had my head down for like three years, producing hundreds of pieces of content, learning how to use content to actually help grow a business and not just, you know, maybe build a personal brand or, or, or build an audience online, but not actually um, sell any products or services. You know, I was accountable to, to bring in customers. So I had to figure out, how to make that happen. And that's where I learned about the, you know, the three buckets or the three objectives for content. And I had to, every time we create something, I had to, you know, before creating it, clarify what it was going to do for us. Was that piece of content for, you know, helping the company become known and build awareness and build authority? Was it going to help bring in some leads? Was it a free resource or a free training that would put somebody on the email list? Or was it going to help them make the decision to use the software and become mm -hmm. a customer? Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been, it's crazy to think how fast time goes by, but uh, that was four years ago now that I left that, that company. Um, they grew really fast while I was there. So it was yep. it, that, you know, no week was the same and we brought in thousands of customers and all the teams grew, you know, by the time I left the marketing team was bigger than the company was when they first hired me. I, I remember like, years ago I was, was at, fun. I was at a maybe it was a conference I'm not sure and and Greg uh, one of one of the founders there was talking about the the sort of the meteoric rise and he was just interested in solving a problem that he personally had when he started that company if, if I remember right. correctly yeah yeah he 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 used to be a lawyer and then he created his first online course to help law students pass <laughs> the the exam I guess and he couldn't find a platform on which to host that course that he liked so he ended up uh partnering up with his brother who had a technical background and they and they built the thing mm -hmm. built the platform and that became thinkific yeah 
Yeah. Cool. cool. And so, so having a story like that to tell is, you know, potentially a great way to connect with people through content, I imagine. For sure. For sure. And pe- people like to, they, they like to understand why you, you know, why you do what you do or why you created the thing. Like what, what problem does it, does it solve? Yeah. And uh, most entrepreneurs will tell you they created their thing because they had the problem and then they wanted to solve their own, their own problem. So, so you made the shift of around four years ago, and you yeah. are now solving a problem for a, a, a specific audience. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that shift. Yeah. Um, there's been a lot of trial and error. Uh, I wish I could say that it's been set, like uh, that I had everything figured out on day one. Uh, when I transitioned out of Thinkific, I wasn't quite confident enough to go on my own. So I partnered with somebody and we sold services for about two years before parting ways. Um, and we sold different types of services. I think our first offer was helping people um, set up a webinar uh, to sell, you know, whatever their course or their program or their offer was. Then uh, then we added a content promotion and repurposing service. Um, and then we added uh, ad management service. And this was us just really, you know, having regular conversations with entrepreneurs and saying yes to the thing that they needed help with. So, so by year two, uh, we had, you know, a handful of clients that we had worked with, but we had provided different types of service to services to them. We had done webinar funnels, we had done content marketing, we had done ad management and we had done consulting. And then finally, um, uh, I think it was about a year into the pandemic where we finally had some breathing room to reflect on all that we had done. And my, business partner and I both realized that um, we had taken on, like we shouldn't have sold too many different things to too many different types of clients. Like the smarter thing to do would have been to focus on one, but we couldn't agree on what that one thing to focus on was because he, he had, you know, different strengths than myself and, and different interests. And so we ended, anyway, we ended up parting ways. um, And then I went back to just consulting with my clients one on one on one guiding their content strategy, helping them grow their audiences and build their email lists and convert their lists into clients. And then uh, around the same time, my wife making the transition into creating, into running her business and creating workshops for educators. And what helped me get more specialized was, was uh, solving my own problem. When I, when I was no longer in that partnership and I had to f- figure out what's the most effective way for me to drum up clients, um, it was workshops. It was hosting live workshops that solved yeah. that problem for me. You know, I, have, I had traffic coming to my website from content I had published over the years and, and I had an email list that I had built by giving away free resources and trainings and to get away from relying on referrals and like have a way to control my own client acquisition i had to pick something that i was going to rely on and for me that became just hosting online workshops live workshops where i help people with something very specific that's related to marketing and then at the end of the workshop i say hey you know if you if you want to work together you can you can book a call and let's chat super simple pitch right um, and so I just started doing that whenever I like needed to fill my pipeline with more calls with potential clients, I would just do a live workshop and help people with something marketing related. Yeah. And so because that solved my problem and a lot of my clients had the same problem of they were publishing content, they were growing their list, but they needed to convert their leads into clients. I said, Hey, why don't we, uh, why don't we do a workshop? And so for the past year or so, I've just really been doubling down on that is, um, I still have like a lot of resources and training and the ability to help entrepreneurs create content to grow their audience and grow their list. But the reason they do those things is because they hope to extract clients from the yeah. list that they build, right? And when it comes to extracting clients from a list, um, right now I'm finding, you know, the best results coming from just doing live live workshops. And as Frank Kern says, I'm pretty sure it was Frank Kern, who I'm sure I'm sure you know he says the best way to convince someone you can help them is to actually help them. And so workshops where you're helping somebody get something done, you know, you're helping them solve a problem that by doing so gives them a taste of what it's like to work with you, but also even helps prepare them for, for working with you. Um, I haven't found, you know, anything that, uh, that beats it just yet. And uh, so that's what I'm focused on 
the most. Yeah. It, it's it's a very smart structure, and I think the the types of businesses that you work with, you you had mentioned, are um, expert based businesses, whether it's a expert who provides a service or education or 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 whatnot, and that that model of being able to guide somebody through a process and maybe give them a few ahas and recognition that maybe they've been looking at the the issue that they're dealing with uh in in a way that's not as effective as what you have to to teach them or show them or or your your method of of attacking it i think you can get a lot uh through the the process of a a workshop that's going to advance the relationship um, and, and you, you know, you, you are a content person, but the fact that the, the type of work that you're doing, I, I think needs to be based on a, a solid relationship as well. Right. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And especially if you, you, you know, in the high ticket space, if you're selling coaching, consulting, or uh, maybe a high ticket software, um, you know, somebody is, is your buyer, your client is, you know, they're taking on a fair amount of risk when they're if they're spending thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars on whatever it is that you, you offer them. Right. And so if you can help chip away at that risk by giving them a small taste of what it's like to be helped by you at a much lower cost, um, then I just find it helps reduce some of the friction and trying to, rather than trying to get somebody from a free training or a free resource or a free webinar to make, you know, a high ticket buying decision, let them become a customer at a lower risk first and then invite them to go deeper with you afterwards. Um, in the case of selling like low ticket products or physical products or impulse purchases, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that, like mm -hmm. doing, you know, educational type workshops. Um, you know, anything that's an impulse buy, you know, a good ad, a good video or a good ad straight to a sales page might just do the trick for you. You, you wouldn't need to do this extra work of uh, spending some time on a lot in a live setting providing education or help to a, to a potential customer, I don't think. Yeah. But I, I think, you know, based on the the type of work that you do, it's an investment, not just of, of money, but of, of time and a, and a belief in the process that you need to really get somebody's buy-in, uh, you know, to. So um, I, I, I guess that the next logical question is, you know, now, now that you've whet my appetite to, you know, see you present and, and host a workshop, how does one find out about them? Yeah. So my favorite way of promoting workshops is through email. So if anybody grabs a free training or a resource through my website, they'll get, they'll see the invitations mm -hmm. to upcoming workshops. I'll occasionally do like run some retargeting ads. If, uh, if I want to scoop up a couple of extra registrations to a workshop, but I, I rely primarily on, uh, on email marketing. And uh, and so, how does somebody um, discover your website and decide that they would like to be a part of that email list? Sure. So, uh, TylerBassu dot com uh, is my that's my home base online, and uh, I also run a uh, a free community on Facebook, a group called Influence and Scale, mm -hmm. um, where I also provide some free resources and training to those group members. So you could you could go directly to my website, or you could go to the group, and in both cases, you'll have the chance to grab some free stuff from me and join join my newsletter beautiful well i we will of course make sure that there's a link to uh, the website and uh if you would like i'll also include a link to the uh, facebook group too tyler basu this has been really really insightful i i appreciate you walking us through this and and i look forward to uh learning more from you in the in the coming weeks and months thanks david this was a lot of fun i hope your audience uh, found this helpful i hope so too Folks, you have been listening to More Perfect Marketing. If you know somebody who could benefit from listening to the conversation you've just heard, please, by all means, share it. Until next time, my name's David Baer. Look forward to seeing you back here again real soon. Take care.